Let's go say three twenty thousand. I didn't put a comma there. Thirty two thousand. I don't know why I didn't put a comma. Now, these are a few of the king's old men, but they would also be knights and men at arms, and then they would get levies, which are some people a little bit of training all the way down to just peasants saying, here's a spear, here's a stick, let's go to war. And you can see a lot of these wars are basically just going to be knights and heavily armored men ripping apart, cutting, hacking, and killing all the levies. The peasants. That's kind of the fight. That's part of the reason for the crusade. We're running out of peasants. <laughs> you stood up. And the defense has a huge advantage. Castles, because of food issue. As long as you're on the defense, you can dig in. The enemy won't be able to attack you very much yet. One shot. One shot. And sieges are almost impossible because of the lack of food. There's almost no roads to get supplies anyways. And so this is going to be a very weird style of war. Yes, you're going to have armored knights. Here's a very stylized photo of British or French armored knights. And by them, they've got more and more away from the chain mail to more plate armor and armor for the horses. And these horses are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, the problem with that is they're usually not as healthy. They're not as hardy if they're that big. And if they're that big and that armored, you got one shot. One you charge, that's it. The horses won't do it again. They're exhausted. Or they might ride them to death. And so with that, it changes the whole nature of war. You got one shot. And so people are going to avoid combat. You don't want to fight unless you know your charge can actually win. Yes. Why are they switching chain mail? Well, we'll get to it, but it's going to be the, the crossbow and the lava. You start going through the chain mail, and once that made it vulnerable. And the big thing is, it's going to be really expensive and in some ways counterproductive. But since these are noble men who wanted to go fight and kill peasants, <coughs> they made this change. It's a very inefficient way to do it. And once um, gunpowder would come in, it they still kept them because they thought they looked cool, yeah. but it would still go out of favor. You didn't sort of see a in World War One cap, French cavalry with armor plates and armored helmets and a white That's the battle. Yeah, that's the battle. Yeah, they were that's, the, that's the, the right near Verdun. That's gonna be hard for anyone. And something else was growing at this time, and I mentioned this before, but I want to get it one more time. There is a developing sense of nationalism. And this is what they'll get every once in a while will perk up. The nationalism is this intense love for your country or in this context, intense love for your country. Why do you love your country? Because it's your country. And the idea is I must protect England from France or in this one it's going to be, I must defend France from the English invaders. And this will be personified by one person will really begin to develop this nationalism in France, and it's going to be almost 100 years into the war. You might have heard of her, Joan of Arc. And that will begin this ideas of nationalism. So what the British advantage? Well, the British, unlike most of the untrained peasant levies, or the individualist, individualist knights who just wanted to kill people and charge and show their bravery and courage in individual combat, the British, knowing they're poor and knowing that they're going to have to go to France and attack, they have better training, especially for their peasants. It was mandatory that all young men must learn how to do what by 1200? What? Specifically, what kind of? The long bow. Learn how to do it. Because it is incredibly difficult to become good at shooting them. Yeah. But to become good at that, but and then they're very strong, but the long bow with a steel tip would change the nature of battle. <laughs> so the French knights were all this individualistic ideas of chivalry, which we talked about for the break, and this individual combat and this one-on-one -on -one combat and the 
British could take advantage of that. Because they know individuals will be rash. Use discipline, smaller forces, but discipline to beat them. Yeah, I'm looking. That was really weird. Have you ever heard that sound before? So, Britain, English, most successful advantages. Here's their basic elements of it. Avoid pitch battles. Quick fights. Quick fight, get out. You have supply issues. As they go, steal all the food and everything they need. If you don't steal it, destroy it. Because the French knights have to live off the land, too. This will be called later on scorched earth. And then the knights, with this huge land and the wealth of France, capture them, hold them for ransom. Give them the quitting. Yes, they're going to do that, including capture many kings, a couple kings. I like that picture for lots of reasons. They might have a little bit of armor, but most part, they just wore uh, leather jerkins. Hard leather, you know, give you a little bit of protection, but they really have armor. And I'm so trying to hear what this pig face thing is. <laughs> what, what is he talking about? Huh? We were talking about that. We did not know what he was doing or what he was. Yeah, what is he doing? Why is he uh, is he holding that? Well, moving on. <laughs> look, I don't know. It just kind of looks like he's just, it's the injured. military technology change. First off, let's be clear about us. Defense is going to be key. If you can be on the defense and let you check, and defense always has a big advantage. Kind of and well, what you want to do is, if you look at the size of this cliff, <laughs> what you do is you put a diversionary attack here, put your main line here, but wait for it. What do you do? Use the hill. Use the hill. So when they attack, you come in behind using the valley as a screen. Well, we learned everything. You also here. use the hill for, um, for your archers. Yeah. That or, you know, artillery, rockets. They have auto rockets. I don't know how well so, rockets. that is the longbow right here. And that is a reenactor doing it. Have you ever seen someone shoot a longbow? So the bow, the one I saw was almost as tall as me. And the guy, and the guy was, the guy was probably five foot eight. So he held this thing like this, and he pulled that thing back. And God, how, you know, and so I try to, you know, if you don't do it, don't work those kind of muscles. I'm like, oh, I can do this. Oh, geez. And he got like 100, 100, 115 pound girl weight with those. I, I don't know. It's probably 10 horses. But <laughs> I just made up something. I have no idea. But he was hitting targets at 100 yards and then 200 yards and then 300 yards. And he was like that and hitting a target. Now, obviously, he's going to be kind of the exception, but everybody trained with a long ball in Britain. Every young man had to train. They hated the training. It was a pain. That's part of the reason why they abandoned the long ball. Up until the 1700s, the long ball probably would have been a better weapon than the musket. The peasants didn't want to do it anymore. It was such hard work. But the long ball could penetrate the chain mail. Now, they already have crossbows here, but crossbows are really heavy. Almost all the crossbow ones would be mercenaries. Do we know what a mercenary is? Great soldier. Yeah, soldier. Not pay. Every soldier pay. But um, but they volunteer at work whoever pays them the most. Because you know soldiers in the United States Army today are paid soldiers, but they're not necessarily mercenaries. Be People who got mercenaries in any army. But, and then you hand crank, you have to hand crank this back, the bowl back, put the bolt in and fire. It's very hard to fire. And because of the hand cranking, you can't have too much tension because it takes too long. So the longbow is going to have a lot better. In fact, twice the power of a crossbow, the longbow. Yes. Have any power with them, they're all okay. Twice the power. So the French had a lot more crossbow and mercenaries almost all from um, what is now Italy. There was no Italy yet. I'm blaming you. 
<laughs> the crossbow. So the crossbow is maybe 50 yards. The longbow, after through armor at 200 yards. But I saw him do it at 300 yards. It seemed like if that arrow was tall, I can't imagine it would have been that tall in the Middle Ages. It was it was this much taller than the guy shooting. The bow just sitting here. And he kind of went back like that. God, that was impressive. Is he good at a bow and arrow? Pretty good. It takes like one or two shots in your practice. Of course, modern bow is a little bit easier to shoot. and But to become very, very accurate at 200 yards. Yeah. But also, oh, six arrows per minute. The first muskets could be about one round every two minutes. So you can imagine the arrows would be good, but it's just so much more work. But also the first cannon would be used. Cannon had arrived from, from China, India, and the uh, and through the Arab world. We also had <laughs> two kind of handheld little cannons. Yes, the precursor to muskets, but they were so inaccurate and pretty much worthless. And they would use little rounded stones and fire. Or sometimes they just pack a bunch of rocks in here and they're all fine. The problem is, it's really hard to cast iron like this. They really didn't know how to do it. They didn't have a drill that could like make a big round cylinder and then drill through to make it. They, didn't, they couldn't do that, so they have to cast the cannon with the opening. And so what's going to happen to a lot of these cannons? There'll be some weakness in it and they'll explore that. Which, as we all can guess, is bad for the morale of the crew of the camp. And so with that, but by the end of the war, everybody had camp. Everybody had camp. And so Edward, King of England in 1346, ostensibly to help Flanders, but don't forget, he wants to become the King of England. He begins a massive raid. And so this is supposedly the English army attacking. That's England with the lion. There's the toad. So the cross here. Now, here's Flanders in this area here. But what he did is he landed over here in, in Norman, near Cherbourg, and landed here and did a raid through France. It was a raid, basically just to knock out areas, take as much uh, land, wealth as you can as possible, Win as many, win any battle as you can. Try to suck in French units. If the French come in too big in numbers, he just runs away. Only attack when he wants to. The whole idea of this raid is to show the weakness of the French king. That's all. And on August 26th, on a raid, during this raid near the town of Calais, so we're getting near, it's basically the escape route. The French have avoided combat. The French organized knights, men at arms, peasant levies to attack Edward at Crescent. And the British were way outnumbered. And this tried to show the battle. And there's men at arms, but here's the long bowmen. Here are the French. And this battle shocked everybody in its ferocity. So Edward is outnumbered two to one. And his main force is here, but these are longbowmen. And he knew one very important thing. The French are desperate to attack. They want to get him. So he can hit the battle site. And he picked a site where there's a city on one side, so it's flank protected here by a creek, and then hills and another town here. So the French have to attack across an open field and attack. And this happened. And um, all three of the big battles, it rained the night before. The ground was muddy. The French weren't going to attack because their horses get stuck in the mud. So what did the British or what did the English do? They taunted them and called them names. And what happened to the French noblemen? Ah, let's get them! So the French plan was at first, the crossbowmen would come close and try to soften the English line, meaning knock out a few. But when they got, their range wasn't as long. And so the longbowmen drove them off. 
And when they ran away, the knights were like waiting for this. Oh, you cowards. And they took off. So the horses can't go as fast across muddy ground. So the horses are going, they're trying to go across, and what happened? A rain of arrows hit them. Now, they did have plate armor, but the plate armor couldn't always protect, and there's gaps like shoulder, arm, neck, where it's chainmail. And a rain of arrows came on them. So what happened? Well, this is a picture of the after the battle. The cream of French nobility was slaughtered. Their horses were killed. In fact, that's why they started arming the horses because of this. Knights were knocked down, and then they tried to get up, but they're floundering in the mud. This was a dramatic victory for the British. Dramatic. And so that, this is one of my favorite pictures, and I, I think everyone should know why I did this. First off, that's the hastily dug grave of the French knights. Now, everyone's actually mad. The longbowmen went out there, and they started, the knights who were just wounded or fell off the horse couldn't get up. The longbowmen took their daggers and cut their throats, and then stick their stuff. Edward wanted them alive. Why? Ransom. Ransom. He was mad. But there's the grave. But do you see why I like this picture so much? Look at Edward and the lion head. Isn't that, that's a weird looking dog just from the picture. Yeah, it's all supposed to look like a lion. I just think that is awesome. Yes, we should all look like that. That, along with, and make that sound of the engagement. So, after that battle, they retreated. There's Crecy right here. And this is how the battle kind of changed, where that's what French held, that's what France held in England. England it shifted back and forth, so eventually the French would hold out. But Edward retreated, won the big victory, but it was like a raid. He couldn't hold the ground. So it didn't necessarily change anything. And so, then the plague hit. I think 50% of the population of France died. So they kind of did a little uh, truce. They let another enemy kill all their soldiers, and they kept fighting. By the way, I put this picture up here because whenever, you, if you type in the word plague into the Google, it comes up with this. And that did not happen. I was about to say, is that what it comes up? So it's supposed to be, everyone would say this is a plague doctor and they would, they would put like herbs and um, various other things to try and breathe through this apparatus to keep away the you know, bad air. And whenever you say this, this is a plague doctor. No, it's wrong plague. It's 300 years later, but I put that up there just to remind me to tell you, if you see that and see this is a plague doctor, not the plague, not the black death. This is the only way we're going to stop Omicron, as far as I know. So we already talked about the plague, so I'm going to move. Oh, no. <laughs> I have to resist the urge to throw my mouse. <laughs> it's gone! I don't even know how I do this. That's, how, that's the march to the sea. So, after this, when the plague started, uh, well, you know, pandemic's last two to three years. And the British tried another raid in southern France. And this is an area called Aquitaine, another area where Edward thought he had a, a loose connection to the throne. And he sent his son, who was a very effective leader, who would be dubbed the Black Prince. <coughs> and the Black Prince on this raid in southern France would once again meet the French army and the cream of French nobility in a place called Poitiers. And the British or the English greatly outnumbered. If I say British, I'm sorry. They're still an independent Scotland. So it's not British, but I'm so used to saying British. So it should be English is more proper. You forgive me. I can tell some of you are really mad. Scotland won't give you. Scotland won't give you. That's the thing. I don't I, and I like Scotland a lot. No, I'm not going to talk about the Scotsman. But 
The English did the same thing. They put their men of war, ground soldiers, basically spear, battle axe, and or a halberd right here. Maybe I'll show you a halberd later on, a wicked weapon. And longbowmen. And there was a big field in the rain before. Does anybody want to guess what happened? Same thing as what happened. The French charged like maniacs and were slaughtered. The same, almost exactly the same outcome as Crescent. Almost exactly the same. Yes. Did you say the Black Prince was Edward's? Yeah. Why was he called Black Prince? Because he always dressed in black. Yeah, there was nothing. Okay. The whole thing about like the black and white, like evil and good, that kind of thing, that didn't come out of colonization and slavery and racism. We're not there at the racism. But these heady days pre racism. Kind of weird. So, the French, the new French king, King John II, was captured. He was captured and held for ransom. This was a huge victory. And to get it, the French would have to give up almost all of what is now southern France. Technically, though, the king was still a vassal of France, but a big victory. But do you get the point here? The French were having trouble learning. I thought they would learn by the first battle, but... But, as a response, something called the Jacquerie. If anyone knows about the French Revolution, there'll be another version of the Jacquerie during the French Revolution. And this was a peasant rebellion before the Lollards. And the, and the peasants, horribly mistreated, they rebelled right after the Battle of Pontier. Now, you would think the English would be like, oh, this is a golden opportunity to attack the French nobility. No. The English joined the French nobility to put down the peasants. Why? Because what were they scared of? They were the same thing. Yeah, their own peasants. And so this will happen. In, this will happen in the Thirty Years' War too. The Protestants and the Catholics will be fighting, and all of a sudden, oh, the peasants are rebelling. Let's get them, and then back the Protestant uh, nobility. And they brutally put this down, executed thousands. But this constant threat of peasant rebellion—that was one of the big issues. Or colonial settlement. The idea is to take these peasants and get them out of here so they don't move out. Of course, this might have consequences in the Americas down the road. But back in England, they think they want a big victory, but not quite. There's going to be a significant amount of trouble. And as you can see from this picture right here, it's going to, I have no idea how I even did that. So, they had their own peasant rebellion, this is the Lollards. They had their peasant rebellion, and it was brutally put down by their new king, King Richard II. Here's Richard II right here. When he took over the throne, he was, what, 14? So, in 1400, he would abdicate because... Continuing the war, high taxation, he was accused of being a tyrant. And he abdicated in favor of his son. So eventually we're close to the Civil War, we're coming up to what's going to be called the War of the Roses. So the new king, Henry IV. By the way, you'll notice a little bit of a discrepancy here. The nobleman said that some will be king. Richard didn't actually agree to that for the next year. So technically, they're going to have two kings. So, Henry IV. And he was from, there are two different noble houses, the House of Lancaster. Why is this important? Well, there will come immediate, immediate conflict with another house, the House of York. One represented by a white rose, and the other represented by a red rose. AKA, World War II. And so with that, so what did he do? He cut the taxes on the nobility. But wait a second, you still need money, don't you? Where do you get money? Huh? You squeeze the peasants for every penny they have, which is nothing at all like the United States. And you've been to Washington State? The French. Huh? The French? Just the French. And you go steal from the French. You go steal from the French. So with that, by the way, who else loves that house? 
Kind of does look like a bad ad, doesn't it? So, they technically ended the war so he could reestablish himself, squeeze the peasants, and then wait to him. Knowing that the French are destabilized, while this is going on, this peasant rebellion, remember the plague hit, the peasants demanding more rights, they're doing higher wages, they have all these conflicts in France, and then, Henry IV, though, would die relatively young. He would be replaced by Henry V. And not only would this become a fantastic play by William Shakespeare, this, you never see Henry V. It's awesome. We have to talk more about Shakespeare, but I love Shakespeare. It's best. Shakespeare is awesome. Not very fun to read, but it's fun to watch. So let's get this really quick. Last thing. Henry V. And he wants the French help one more time. So what does he do? He does another raid. So he lands near Le Havre, which is then, this is called Harfleur, today it's Le Havre, Harbor City right here. I preached in that town. There's my story about that. Okay. You ever had bad crooks? No, not really. What? No, not really. Not even really even a bad shell, even if you had Nutella and banana on it, good for you. Okay, now I'm hungry again. <laughs> and they get another raid, combination to get loot, but Britain still controls most of southern France. Flanders is still here. And in the process right here, they'll meet the French nobility again at a place called Agincourt. And at Agincourt, French finally learned. Okay, no. <laughs> The British soldiers, they are almost all the knights are now on foot. Their horses have died or they had to eat them because of lack of forage and food. I know. He's that horse. Only a couple of us. I didn't want I didn't want I didn't even know I was ordering this. My choice at this this restaurant would be calves head. Um, some kind of like bait fish, uh, some kind of rabbit intestine thing, or something else that I thought was beef in this horse. Yeah, I should have got a cat. Yeah, the cat's a really with a plate with a head on. I'll never forget that they sat down the table, and the, and the little girls in there just started to cry. <laughs> <laughs> and I know they're thinking, dumb, dumb girls. Okay, moving on to the longbow. So they didn't have all they had were their longbowmen, and the longbowmen have been suffering for dysentery for weeks. The whole trip. Now, dysentery caused by amoeba, amoebic dysentery. It is a so it's kind of an infection. But you know what happens to you if you have dysentery? To not to go into too many vivid details. <laughs> Think of the worst diarrhea possible and then multiply that by a thousand. It's, it's incredibly deadly because you just dehydrate so quickly. And so they all suffer from, they're suffering from dysentery. And so you can imagine that march. And they're just, I mean, they're barely making it, just misery. And here are the French following them. Henry V realizes this raid is a disaster, but he can't escape the French. They're almost out of horses. Their knights are on foot. The most important part of the battle of the lawmen are all have dysentery. And so what they do is he picks a spot with a few knights who are on foot and then ground soldiers and archers, and they all dig stakes and plant them into the ground. Makes sense? Horses, much like humans, don't like to be impaled. And then begin to talk the French. English really love talking to French. Have you been around Englishmen? No. And they started talking the French. And the French got all geared up, another swampy ground, rained the night before, and they charged again. And they tried to stop them, but they just couldn't uh, get them. And they just go charging. They make sure they're in between two hills, basically city and forest, and then mountains. They, you know, that's the thing, the British could pick, the English could pick where the attack was. And almost all the longbowmen 
They were shooting arrows as fast as they could, so they had kind of jerkins or breeches, and they were around their ankles. Because they had to go to the bathroom the whole time. So that must have been one of the most horrific battles in so many ways. So you can imagine the point of view of these law women who are miserable. And the ink bread starts slogging at them, and they just start cutting them down with the arrows. And so horses begin to be hit. So horses screaming in agony, men in agony, flopping around in the mud. And what did they do? With great glee, they went out there, and the call was this time. He said, no prisoners. We didn't have time for ransom. And with glee, they went after that nobility. And with their knives, cut their throats. So right between with their helmet and their plant armor here. <laughs> We're not going to eat all the other throat, but I think you can imagine. And slaughter them. them. This would be the greatest victory in English military history up to that time. And would change, I mean, change the entire course of the war. It looked like the French had won. I mean, it looked like Henry's going to be able to make himself king of England, or king of France, too. Hope the plague doesn't hit. Moving on. All right. We have a little bit of the finish. We'll finish this tomorrow. Mm-hmm. By the way, can you believe in three major, huge battles? There's not very many battles. There's not a lot of battles to learn from. The French do the same thing three times. Are they going to finally learn? Probably not. Yeah. Yes. And Joan of Arc will make a big difference. Oh, um, Alex going first. I wasn't going to, but I know he's wearing shorts, so it's like freezing. You got to flip it. Uh, yeah, there you go. Very good, thank you. Say goodbye to the... If you look carefully... Yeah, that's supposed to be bare legs, because of the jerk is around it. No, it's only a one What? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. They used to Valentine's Day, right? Yeah. Jeez. Oh. How much do you want to talk about the game? Four of the roads are so good. Oh! Here's a question for the class, really quick. Homer Plessy. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. We'll do the quiz on Friday. I did not give you as much time as I wanted, but I'm going to give you a map in the morning. Sound good? Yay. Does anybody, know, does anybody remember the a court case by the name of Plessy versus Ferguson? Yeah. All of you should probably know that, or at least have a pretty good idea. That said, separate but equal facilities was constitutional. The state of Louisiana today just pardoned Homer Plessy. First crime. Kind of mind boggling. No, he's not alive. <laughs> the North Cage was in 1996. <laughs> it's one of those symbolic moves to show how much the South is wrong. <laughs>